Good afternoon, everybody. Um, sorry, my back and forwards across the stage here. I'm just being extremely distracted by the uh, the islands that were going past on either side. And uh, you know, we're in the Beagle Channel. I'm going to talk about Darwin and the Beagle here. And uh, these these islands, they've got a curious shape to them. They're, they're very um, sort of uh, sharp-sided on the, the, if you want, upstream end of them, and they tail off. And that actually tells us the direction the ice sheets were waning, and they were waning and receding back up towards Ushuaia here about 15,000 years ago, and they left these deposits. And these deposits are known as drumlins, and it's the only word that comes from um, uh, the, the Irish, uh, Irish Gaelic and it's, it's a word that you find in Southern Ireland for these sort of um, elongated hills. And you see uh, not just one of them at a time, but you'll see kind of, you know, many of them in, in, in these fields of drumlins. Uh, there's various Irish songs that go on about them from the south, particularly southwest Ireland. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be just watching. Apart from the birds out here today, it's a, it's a great scene to watch. Um, I decided I would give a talk this afternoon on Darwin, and you might say, what's Darwin, the biologist, got to do with um, a geologist, a geophysicist? Um, and what I hope to, to explain and, and tell you about and, uh, this afternoon is, is Darwin not as the great biologist that we all remember him for, but actually Darwin the geologist. And this is little known. I think uh, even when I first started reading uh, about Darwin, you know, I thought, oh, it's all about, you know, the origin of species, etc., the descent of man. And uh, it's got, you know, he's got nothing to do with, with what I was studying in university, which is geology. But in fact, uh, he has an awful lot about geology. He has a lot of things to say about place and time. And as you might know, I'm quite interested in both of those two things, uh, geologically looking back at time and seeing how time and place have changed. And uh, I open this by saying, well, what does a farmer from 18th century Scotland, very close to, to where I uh, teach now in the University of St. Andrews, in fact, the studies of phrenology and I'll come on to what that is, if you don't know. Um, some boulders in Wales, and uh, actually close to where I was born, uh, boulders, uh, we call them erratic boulders, all have in common. Well, they have Darwin in common. And uh, this afternoon, I'm going to, to, to hopefully tell you why, and why that's got a lot to do with the expedition. Even though Darwin never made it down uh, you know, to, to where we've just come from. He did make it down to this part of the world, and we're in the Beagle Channel, named after the ship that he uh, traversed around the world on, and really was the, the, the great formative period of his science education, was on board the Beagle. So Darwin was born 1809 in um, Shropshire in England, near a town called Shrewsbury. It's on the Welsh borders. And he went to Cambridge, graduated from Cambridge University, um, and, he, and he left there after five years, you know, on his five-year voyage, he left, for, graduated from Cambridge with a kind of a general science background. I mean, he wasn't a specialist particularly in biology. Um, he wasn't a specialist in, in geology. I mean, back then, you got these kind of natural science degrees, and that's really what he came out with. Um, we know he returned after the voyage to London, um, and he was befriended and really embedded himself in the, the London Scientific Society of the day, and particularly that associated with what's called the Royal Society, um, and a group of very influential, in fact, geologists, uh, Charles Lyell being one of the, the, the most famous. Um, but he went on after that to read and to uh, you know, formulate his thoughts that ended up with the theories of evolution, etc. Um, really, after reading a lot of other important um, writings of the time, things on economics, in fact, and economic theory development, which helped formulate his thoughts on, on, on what we know today as evolution. Um, he was married in, in 1839, actually he married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, and if you're a, uh, a, a pottery buff, you'll know the Wedgwood family. They're a, a very big Midlands family, very influential in, in this time period, particularly because of sponsoring the sciences. And uh, she very much helped uh, him publish the Voyage of the Beagle, the journals of his travels on, on the ship as he went around this part of the world. 
It wasn't actually until 1858 that he made the presentation that we all know him from today and that presentation on the origin of species. And it was in a series of papers uh, that, that he presented along with a chap called Wallace. And uh, again, I, I will um, revisit this at the end of the talk that I'm going to give now. Um, it wasn't uh, till very much later in his life, in fact, until 1870, that he published The Descent of Man. And that has, again, a particular uh, resonance to this part of the world and to not only his travels here on the Beagle on its second voyage around the world, but to Fitzroy, who is the, the, the captain of it, and the first voyage of the Beagle to this part of the world. And again, I'll come back to that. So that's Darwin. He's de he died and was buried at Westminster Abbey in London in 1882. Are, are you okay there, sir? Is that Yeah, okay. Great. We don't want accidents on this last day here. So to put his life, Darwin's life, in perspective, we've really got to look back before that and see some of the, the important figures scientifically that laid the foundations for his theories. And we have to go back, actually, I think, to 1680, and a guy called Nicholas Steno, um, and really the start of what we call paleontology, the study of fossils, the evolution of the fossil record of plants and animals. We come on from that to a chap called James Hutton, and, and he was um, a geologist, and this geologist from Scotland. I'll say a bit more about him. Other characters that really influence what Darwin was thinking are people like Cuvier, George Cuvier, and Lamarck, um, both of whom were working on this whole uh, succession of species ideas that Darwin sort of coalesced in his great works. A key, key... Uh, influencer, though, on Darwin's thinking was this guy Lyell, Charles Lyell, who published a book called The Principles of Geology. I'll come on to those and, and why they're so important in a minute. So it starts with this chap here, Nicholas Steno. He was actually a priest in Italy. And um, he was looking at uh, different types of fossils he was finding in the local uh, vicinity of his, his parishes, etc. And he was looking at them. There were fossils in what we call sedimentary rocks. So they're layers of sediments that have been laid down. And he was able to appreciate the, the laying down of these layers over a space of time and an extended period of time. And the fact that these layers represented different points or periods in the past. And he was speculating that that must be quite a long time period in the past, and that the oldest part of that record would be at the bottom of the sequence and the youngest at the top. Now, that might not sound like rocket science, OK? But, but this is sort of already fundamentally starting to change the thinking, of course, of the church at the time, that all species were made by God on the X day, and all came together, and then you had later on, you know, so you had this six-day creation of the world, so everything come in at one time. No, what he was starting to think about was the fact that you had a series or a time period building through time that the old things were at the bottom and the young things are at the top. So as you laid down these sediments, you got this succession appearing in layers. And, you know, he gives us this, uh, this beautiful set of work that is written up, actually looking at shark's teeth he was finding in these rocks and the development of shark's teeth over time. And, you know, this is quite a long time ago. He summarized it and in a way that we now call it the, being the principles of stratigraphy. And stratigraphy is about this layering one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer, establishing that things happen over time. And as we go back through that sequence, we can look back in time. Okay? Time when given stratum, those are layers of rock, are being formed. They rest upon it, you know, a fluid laying these things down. And the lowest was the, the oldest and, and the youngest is at the top. So, and if we get any what we call discontinuities across that, it must have formed after this layering sequence went ahead. So he's already thinking about you know, um, time, he's thinking about things in succession of time, and hiatuses or, or, or you know, discontinuities in time within this sequence. So that's from a fossil point of view. Um, this chap here, a Frenchman, um, was very instrumental in, 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 a, in establishing the same sorts of thoughts, but looking at anatomies, anatomies of species as they develop through time. Again, looking at the 
paleontology, fossils, things fossilized in the past. And he's comparing them to living animals. And so you've got this comparison of what we know today to what we see in the fossil record. And this, again, really lays a foundation down of what we call vertebrate paleontology. So looking at things with vertebrae and seeing how they develop through time, again, through succession of strata. So again, we're starting to think of, of, of the rock record of something extending far further back and doing things in evolutionary terms that we take for granted today, but were not taken for granted back in the time that these guys are thinking about these things. So, you know, he, he believed then in not only successions of time, but also cycles, cycles of development. And so you'll know from my other lectures, I'm quite into cycles of things, cycles of creations and destructions. And he even went one step further to say that when we get big hiatuses or discontinuities in time, these can represent global events so global extinctions, things that change on a global basis. And so deluges, volcanoes, catastrophes can have cataclysmic effects on the succession of time. I said there was a famous uh, uh, link to geologists in my part of the world, and we really call this chap here James Hutton. He was a gentleman farmer that lived in the Lothians. And uh, in his farming, he, he took these ideas, and he was very interested in the fossils that he was finding on his own lands. And indeed, not just that, but again, this whole concept of succession of layers. And he was looking at the, uh, the washing away of the soil off his farmlands, but then how it would also deposit in different places and build up these sequences over time. And he started studying, studying that in a kind of gentlemanly way that they did back then. And uh, started thinking about it in terms of not just his local farm, but again, more globally, what this might mean. So global uh, ex extinctions, global events, deluges, volcanoes, catastrophes, and this being the catastrophic or catas catas cataclysm theories. But he was also... Um, observing the gradual changes, gradual changes on his farmland and applying that to the rocks that he saw around him. And in fact, the bottom image there are rocks very close to his farm. It, it's a classic uh, place of, uh, to look at geology in Scotland. In fact, in the world, it's, it's a sequence of rocks and it's known as Hutton's unconformity. And you can see there that there is rocks on the bottom that are or layers. You can see banding that is going vertically and then bands that are coming cross cut to that. And so the, the, the banding is this uniformitism, this sort of gradualism, things uh, building up over time, but then interspersed by discontinuities. And there's a discontinuity there. And we call this Hutton's unconformity. And, and this, this very famous quote from him really summarized how he thought about time and evolution, that there's no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. So he's now starting to think about and they're starting to propose that, no, 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 no we don't have ushers, and he was, a, he was a bishop usher, usher came up with a calculation of the age of the earth based on the Bible of six and a half thousand years odd. We don't have that as our sort of like, that's, that's what it's all about. We have this almost infinite time stretching back into the past that shows this gradual transformation, and that we might actually have an infinite time going into the future. Now, they had no way to date what that kind of, how big a time that was in the past or in the future at this point. Um, but that was the next big thing to start thinking about. Hutton, actually, uh, if you read any of his, his writings of this, it's really difficult. He, he couldn't write at all, and uh, explaining his theories was terrible, so it didn't actually get very far. It took till Charles Lyell came on the scene um, and started, uh, this was a time period where the grand tours of Europe were something that you did if you, were, if you were in the society of that time. And Charles Lyell came on, and he took this, re this writing, and he started applying those thoughts everywhere during his travels. And he started seeing that this was truly was a global phenomenon, that you could see these layers of, of time in many rocks around the world. And that the Earth must therefore be not just you know, hundreds to thousands, but millions of years old, if you look at the succession of rocks that, that, that were there to be observed. Conditions to play out in a geological time record. He was also very clever, and he went to this, this one place here. This is the, um, in Naples, the Temple of Serapis in Naples. 
And you can go there today, in fact, and you can see the pillars that, that the Romans uh, set up there. And halfway up these pillars, they are bored into by a marine mollusk. And that, that marine, therefore, sea level, must once upon a time have been halfway up these pillars. And when he went there on the Grand Tour, he was saying, well, how, how did that happen? You know, clearly when they built the temple, they were out of the water. But at some point in their time, between him going there and their building it, those pillars have been under the water, and now again they're back out of the water. See the cycles coming in? Yet more things that, that I'm interested in, cycles of time. He, he was looking at that, and he was able to push this whole uh, principles of what we now call uniformitarianism, that uniformly things change over time, mechanisms, but they're constantly changing in these sorts of cycles, cycles on a big geological time period. So he published all this in a, in a very famous volume called The Principles of Geology. Actually, it's two volumes, books. And as a young Darwin was getting interested in all these things, he hooks up with the, um, the head of the, what was the British Geological Survey at the time, a Royal Observatory, who takes him on a great tour around Wales, and that starts in Shrewsbury, near where, where, where Darwin comes from, and this is after he graduated, and Darwin's got great thoughts of, of trying to test some of these natural theories that, that were being pushed by the geologists at the time. And Sedgwick um, takes him on this tour to North Wales, and then down to, very close where I live, down, down, uh, was brought up down in Barmouth there. And he's, uh, you know, helping Darwin's develop his thoughts on geology, and on this whole idea of successions of time. And as they're going, they're not only um, observing in the rocks this whole principle of uniform materialism going on, but they're also looking at a landscape that's been heavily glaciated. And of course, we've been in lots of heavily glaciated landscapes, and in fact, we're traveling through one here now. And in North Wales, there's a particular uh, set of mountains and a valley called Cumidwil, and a cum in Welsh is the equivalent in the US of a bowl. So it's where a, a glacier has, an embryo glacier has started before it makes a proper glacier to flow down the hill. And um, they're looking at these things and thinking about them. They're thinking about how the, they could have been cut. They've, they've got Charles Lyell's books, who's gone around Europe and seen the Alps and seen glaciers there. They're looking at the, the rocks, the pebbles, the boulders through these landscapes and speculating on how they've got there. And they've seen these things in the, in the Alps, these big glaciers doing it. They're looking at the rocks and seeing rocks that clearly were initially laid down at sea level. They contain fossils of shells, but now they're up in the mountains. How does that happen? They're seeing the results of volcanoes in these mountains, where no volcanoes exist today. And all these things are starting to fester in Darwin's brain. They're starting to sort of churn there, and it's like, well, how do all these things fit together? How do all of them sort of slot? You know, what, what's going on? What are the, what's driving the cycles? You know, what's driving deposition in one place and volcanism in another? And to an active mind like Darwin, this is, this is like, you know, how, how am I going to make sense of all of this? He was interrupted in his sense-making. He was about to go off to Tenerife, in fact, and, and uh, it's a very active vulcan vulcan volcanic area, Tenerife, and he thought, well, I'll go down there and, and I'll try and understand volcanoes today, and that might help with some of my thoughts. His, his Tenerife expedition failed, but uh, he was well-connected, and this chap came along, Fitzroy. He had been given the captaincy of the Beagle, and he'd actually been down at this part of the world on the Beagle's first trip. And uh, he, he had been um, offered the captaincy to come down again. He was a Tory Anglican, actually, of royal descent. Um, he was a fantastic surveyor uh, and a hydrographer. In fact, he invented several barometers, which are really, in principle, used today in terms of working barometric pressure out. Um, but he took command of the Beagle, and like most ships in those days, they needed a general naturalist on board. And when Darwin heard this, he was desperate. This is like, hang on, I can really go, I can get somewhere, get my teeth into something, and uh, become you know, a part of this. But um, old Fitzroy there, he didn't want to pay for one. And in fact, he had very strong views. Darwin proposed himself to be this naturalist, and uh, Darwin was a Whig rather than a, a, a royalist. And a Whig in, in um, 
uh, in British political terms, is kind of the opposite. It's like you know Republicans and de Democrats, right? So um, you know the 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 Royalist there, Fitzroy. Uh, you know the politics of Darwin didn't really fit in. Uh, Fitzroy is staunch Anglican, and uh, Darwin is kind of like yeah, whatever, toe in the line, but he's he's not really you know um, in the in the sort of the fold of the church. Um, you know, in, in any one particular way, and in fact, he's not, he's the opposite to a Tory. He's he's not a royalist at all. In fact, he would rather, you know, dismiss all of that. And the other thing is, um, his nose was not right. Now that might seem a really funny thing to say, but uh, Fitzroy was, was was one of these people who studied um, physiognomy, right? And that's that's kind of an ancient art. Uh, it's been going on for some time. Uh, Aristotle makes mention of this sort of thing. It's face reading, right? Is what it is. And Fitzroy actually writes that that you know Darwin's nose is too squashed against his face, and and that means that he can't be that intelligent. Um, now, <laughs> yeah, well, went on to prove him wrong on that one, didn't he? Um, but yeah, flat nose. How could he have the fortitude to, to succeed on an expedition like mine? Anyway, uh, thankfully Darwin had some some uh, help in getting on the expedition. He had the blessing and the money from his his both his father and his in fact his uncle, who was Joshua Wedgwood of the Wedgwood um, family, and they're both quite influential in in the right places. And so off they go. Darwin was given the appointment of naturalist and. In his library, and naturalists would take with them the sample and tools of the trade for, to do in the natural science, and they would take a library with them on the boat. And one of the principal books that he took with him was Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, the two-volume set. And it was almost like the Bible to, to Darwin. He was, th this really defined his thinking in terms of how he was looking at landscapes, you know, how he was going to approach landscapes in terms of natural systems observations, his notes, his note making of, of what he would see on his travels and how he would record things. This was, was all set out in the principles of geology. So the Beagle joined the Beagle. It's a, it's a small, uh, what's called a Cherokee class, 10 gun sloop. Um, not a great size ship. Uh, it had a complement of 65 and nine uh, uh, extras like Darwin and, and, uh, and others on board and, and off it set. And um, if you ever get a chance to read any of the, the voyages of the Beagle, the, the write-up that Darwin did do on that, um, this uh, image on the bottom right there, Conrad Martins was the um, uh, uh, um, artist for the, the voyage. An absolutely stunning, beautiful artwork that, that ever you get a chance to see any of it uh, in, in, in its fullness, it's absolutely stunning. Um, and it's not only stunning in, in, in a kind of an artistic sense, it's incredibly accurate. Okay, back then you had to be not just artists who were going to sort of, you know, do your, your Pollocks of this world or whatever. You you wanted things that would record what there was seen on the voyage, and and I will show you how how accurate he actually was as we go through this. So th there's the second voyage of the Beagle. It went out of London, came down South America, came down the South American coast, and spent an awful lot of time down this part of the world. You know. We're in the Beagle Channel, named after the Beagle, out to the Falklands, roundabout, um, before it actually went up and around, of course, to the most famous place we know, which is the Galapagos Islands for his studies, and then finally back around Australia, uh, around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, and back up to the, the United Kingdom. The first stop-off was in a place called Cape Verde, and they anchored there near Quail Island, and uh, here's some quotes from what, what Darwin writes in his journals. And he saw the glory of the tropical vegetation. And, um, you know, he has a wonderful turn of phrase. It's well worth reading, you know. A glorious day, like giving a blind man eyes. You know, he's come out of a dull British landscape into this glorious vegetation. You know, very, very colourful. And, and it's really blowing his mind. It's, it's, it's an assault on his senses to see all this. And it was also an assault in his sense as to see geology jumping out at him. And here in particular, he's noticing bright white layers with shells sandwiched between black lava. Okay, so he's, he's seeing a sedimentary rocks, a corals and shells with lavas laid out on top of them. But he's not only observing that, he's looking at the different heights of what he calls upheaval. As the volcanoes are being erupted, 
down here at Cape Verde. He's seeing how they depress the rest of the sedimentary rocks they're going through. So where else on our trip have we started to see the depression of rocks because of the weight of another rock on top of them? Okay, he didn't get to the Antarctic, but we're seeing the same sorts of things in terms of densities of rocks that we were seeing down there. And this, these are, uh, are images taken from his notebooks um, down there. A little bit further, f further south, here, Blanca. Um, here, his, his uh, terminology, the pleasures of the first day's partridge shooting cannot be compared with finding a fine group of fossil bones. I can't agree more. I do like, I do like uh, upland shooting, but um, to actually go and find the, the, the fossils, it's like the former times with almost a living tongue. They're telling him what that life was like in the past. It's this wonderful experience of reading the rocks that he was getting. In fact, down there, it wasn't just the small fossils he was finding. Nine different types of what we call quadrupeds and four different types of ground, types of ground sloths and armadillos. They found these 12,000-year-old fossils. Now, they couldn't date them back then, but he knew that they were fossils. Um, actually, and as a side, um, another great fossil hunter of the day, which you probably don't know that he was, Thomas Jefferson, um, he's actually discovered... Uh, he was a great paleontologist or a fossil hunter. Um, he discovered a number of different... Um, uh, quadrupods up further north, up into the, into the lower 48s, and in fact published scientific papers on it. I mean, I think, I think to myself today, well, uh, well, of course, Trump's gone. I don't think Trump maybe maybe be able to produce a scientific paper on... Uh, anyway, we're not going into politics. Um, I, I was told to stay clear of politics. I'll stay clear of politics. Uh, anyway, Darwin goes on south. Christmas Day he spends in a place called Port Desire. Um, it's not actually that nice uh, a, a place. Magellan had a mutiny there and, and hanged a bunch of people. Um, in fact, Drake subdued a mutiny there as well and hanged a bunch more um, uh, earlier times. But the picture there shows what um, the, the volcano known as Tower Rock looks like. And in fact, you can go there today and see a, a view of it very, very similar to what uh, Conrad Martins drew. And in the background around it, you see in Darwin's notebook here, these stair steps, okay? Stair steps of raised beaches. The landscape responding to what was the deglaciations that were going on. Landscapes responding to different um, sea level cutting actions in the past. So he's observing this, that, that not only the rocks are there and you can look at sequences, but the rocks are doing things up and down differently. They're cycling through different types of states. Um, so some, some incredible um, observations that he was making. And observations that, that were driving his thoughts about what's the, what's the underlying theories stitching all this together? What could, what could be, be making the rocks to do these different things in different places? So these distinct, what we call planar surfaces, uplift and periodic rest, so erosion along these different planes. And of course, you know, there, Half Moon Bay, that's exactly what we saw. Different raised beaches, as we call them, different... Uh, erosion and depositional stages that represent the de-weighting of that ice at Half Moon Bay. Now, he didn't see the ice right behind it, but he's, he's remembering things he's seen in the Alps and other places and thinking about them in that way. He goes down to the Rio Santa Cruz, and if you ever get the chance of going up the Rio Santa Cruz, you'll see again these levels cut on both sides of the Rio. Um, showing different elevations where the sea and river have interacted in the past, and they hold up there to make repairs on the ships over a number of days. He also, though, discovered a number of boulders strewn about the landscape through there, boulders that we call erratic boulders. And an erratic boulder isn't something that's just like, you know, um, got no sort of sense of direction or whatever else, but in geological terms, it really has that. In other words, it's come from somewhere else. So here's some erratic boulders. There's actually the right-hand one there is, is in the village of the town of Shrewsbury in Shropshire, where he came from. And uh, it, he knew about this erratic boulder. It's of a geological uh, rock type that has no near equivalent to Shrewsbury. In fact, the nearest rock equivalent to that is about 150 miles away where it could have been sourced. Um, here's some other uh, perched rock boulders. And in fact, you know, when we've been on the tr our travels in the last few days, each beach 
is being covered with pebbles, which I would call erratic pebbles. Okay, the rocks behind them, the solid rocks, are not of the same type that we've been seeing on the beaches. Um, and as you've been landing, you've seen maybe the pinks and the whites and the greys and the greens. The glaciers have been carrying these materials from further afield. They're sampling away from where they're depositing. So we call them erratics. And, and Darwin was noticing these erratics all the way through his travels down South America. So river terraces, different cut-in levels. Valleys that could have been eroded as a channel to the sea at one point, but now the sea and the, the river is very much lower down. What could have caused that? You know, we have lots of these lavas being pushed out at different levels, but then we're also seeing them capped by sedimentary things that say beaches. Sea level has changed a lot. How do we do that? And he was perplexed by this. He was, he was, you know, this was a confusion. How could he get a theory, get something to tie all these things together? He made some beautiful maps, and this is his hand-coloured map of the geology of, of where we're coming through at the moment. In fact, you can see the Beagle Channel here. We're coming up it. We, we came around Cape Horn. We're coming up in through the Beagle Channel in here, and that's his geological map of this part of the world, showing um, the different types of rocks. Tomorrow you'll go up into the National Park, and you'll see some of the, the crumpled rocks that represent the big... Um, uh, uh, deformation along the shearing zone, like a San Andreas fault zone, that actually goes the next valley system up to the Beagle Channel. Okay, so he's looking at this, he's, he's, he's understanding them. And there he is, uh, Conrad Martin's uh, sketch of the Beagle in the Beagle Channel itself, along with some of the natives in there. Some wonderful, wonderful um, diagrams um, geologically accurate about what's going on with the glaciers and the mountains uh, in the background. As he's coming up these fjords, he's seeing um, the different forms of them that we actually see today in, in our crews and noting them and thinking about what must have been here, knowing the types of geology that carved out fjord landscapes in the past from his travels in Europe. And that type of, of, of uh, geology, of course, is the glaciers coming down and carving it. So he's already thinking about what must have been here in the past. He leaves this part of the world and he starts his way up the, the, the west coast of South America. And in fact, he gets as far as this place. And this is um, Orzono. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a volcano um, on the way up the, uh, the west coast. And when he's going up fairly close to it, the thing is erupting. Later on, from the eruptions you see in there, he's getting records that people at the same time are, f are feeling earthquakes for a thousand kilometers away up and down the coast of South America. And so he's now starting to think to himself, well, volcanoes and earthquakes, there must be some sorts of relationship between them. Okay? You would not have these coincidences in time of the events if they weren't related in somehow and in some way. And in fact, he experienced an earthquake, the Conception earthquake of February the 20th, 18... I've forgotten the exact date of it now. 1838, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It was... Anyway. He felt this earthquake when he was there. He felt a minor amount of it, and in fact, it wasn't just the earthquake that he was able to feel, but he was actually able to witness on some islands, um, very close to where the Beagle was, the uplift of those islands at the same time as the earthquake, at the same time as these volcanoes were going off. And this uplift caused what was once under the water, these mussel beds, to now be exposed some eight feet 10 feet above high tide level. And so the rocks are moving in response to earthquakes. The rocks are moving in response to earthquakes and volcanoes are going off at the same time in response to earthquakes. And he's concluding that the cause was rendering this strata, this strata, these rocks, being upraised because of the injection of fluids beneath them. The fluids being, of course, the lavas that were then exiting out at some of these volcanoes. And he had this, this view of sort of underneath the earth, it being lifted up by molten rocks. Incredibly far-sighted thinking that all of these things were joined together. 
And further, that these things were happening not just once, but they were happening on a periodic basis. There were cycles to them. There was a cyclicity giving us rise to the world's great mountain chains. So he's going and saying, what I observe here, I can now extrapolate on a global level. I mean, this is absolutely fundamental to our understanding of geology, that we're going from just seeing a rock here, interpreting the rock in association with other rocks, and now saying that something global must be tying these things together. His travels took him further. And uh, this is actually um, from Fitzroy's write-up, and he let Fitzroy write up some of these things because it was a, a, a bathymetric survey of the time. So Fitzroy, as, as a hydrographer, was very interested in mapping sea where, not only where land was, but where the depths of the sea. And they went up to some of these coral at atolls. And uh, Lyle, Charles Lyle, again, had already proposed that the atolls grew as a result of underwater volcanoes uh, slowly growing. But Darwin speculates that the land rising in South America probably means that other places the land must be falling. He's seen these differences in sea levels. And so if you push in some part up, say the South American coast, then maybe somewhere else where these atolls are, things are sinking. And so these atolls sinking the volcanoes sinking on these ones, but the corals growing up out of them, keeping rate of growth rate with that sinking. So he's, you know, his imagination is really going quite wild on all of this. As I say, Fitzroy actually published all of this um, because of, of his very, very detailed observations he did on that. Darwin himself gets together these ideas we don't actually have plate tectonics proved for another 150 years. A unifying theory of plate tectonics doesn't come along until that time when um, Wegener, Alfred Wegener, starts to think about it in the early 20th century. And of course, we don't have the proof of plate tectonics really until the 1960s. Okay, he's speculating things way before his time here. True genius. His nose was uh, not letting him down in, in, in uh, understanding or sniffing out what was going on inside the earth. Anyway, he returns to London after all of this, and I'm going to leave out the Galapagos and, and that part of it, because um, although he made lots of observations on finches and finch species and the diversity of finches there, um, it's really the next part in London I think is quite interesting. As he comes back to London, he's actually um, elected as a fellow of the Geological Society of London. Um, that's the sort of the highest body of geologists in the UK. And uh, he begins to write his log up, his, his voyages. Um, he's still keeping active, uh, you know, in terms of observations. In fact, he goes back to North Wales and he sees an, with new eyes these erratic boulders that he's seen. He sees with new eyes that glacial landscape, having visited glaciers in South America, the striations on the rock, the smoothed rocks that we saw on our landing at Nico. He's seeing those in North Wales. He's seeing them up into Scotland. He's seeing even more up in Scotland than, than he'd seen when he'd been there before. This is, this is a glen in Scotland called um, Glen Roy. And uh, these striations across the landscape from his, his drawing of it there are called the parallel roads of Glen Roy. And they look like um, some great uh, engineer has uh, made a bench, a flat horizontal surface, three times up the Glen sides. And there was a lot of, you know, giants made this and all that kind of speculation. Whereas, you know, Darwin looks at it and says, ha oh, no, I've seen these things before. This is clearly sea levels that have cut these. Now, the problem there is that these are 800 meters, you know, these are 1,200 feet up the valley sides. So that's a lot of change, sea level-wise. And in fact, um, the uh, sea had not got up to those levels. Uh, you can see them picked out here in some of the early maps that he produced uh, for it. Um, rather, there had been an ice dam, a big glacier in the glen downstream for it from these that dammed a lake behind at that elevation. Um, Darwin published on this, got it wrong. 
And in fact, it's one of those great things. He calls it his greatest mistake ever. Um, and 20 years after publishing it, he wrote a, uh, a paper um, admitting, or not admitting, just saying, well, you know, I got it wrong. Somebody else has got it right now. Fantastic that he could do that. Anyway, he's still not, uh, you know, giving us his biology, his great biology. He's still doing geology at this stage. He comes back he writes up the voyage of the of the HMS Beagle. Um, he does that in the, the natural history geology of the countries visited during the voyage of the HMS Beagle around the world. And it's a great publication. People buy that. Um, Fitzroy publishes papers on the coral reefs, certain elevation changes, and uh, accompanied by some, some rather fine uh, drawings of the interpretations of what's going on on that. He publishes on uplift, and these uplift rates he saw on the east coast of, um, of uh, South America here, um, the observation and proofs of the recent elevations on the coasts of Chile, um, the east and west coasts he's talking about here. So he's doing a lot of publication, but still nothing in biology. You know, this is his work on, on the formation uh, of mountain chains and volcanoes. So tying it all together. And I think one of, one of the, 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 the you know, most fundamental geological papers that was written of that time. A unifying theory, really. But, you know, the fossils left him with this concept that the Earth is millions of years old. Now, he had no way of dating how old that millions of years are that fossils progressed from simple to increasingly complex. He was making observations on shells and the morphology of shells changing and saying, well, things progress through time and that time is millions of years. That environments change and they can change both dramatically during that time and gradually during that time. That we get uplift and subsidence ongoing and these affect species in different ways. So do you see where his thought plan is going on this? Species could become isolated and extinct, or they could progress and change and develop. He's got theories, but he's got nothing really hard and fast to be able to write his theories out in a scientific way and, and really explain them or verify them um, scientifically. He's forming a, this theory, species organisms develop through natural selection. Inherent variations increase the individual's um, sort of uh, ability to survive and reproduce. But he's still not got the data to fundamentally prove this. He's been around the world. He's seen the finches of Galapagos. He's seen all the shells. He's seen the fossil record. But he's not got enough proof. He's a geologist. At this point, he is a geologist. He is not a biologist. He feels comfortable as a geologist, but he doesn't feel he's got the reputation as a biologist. And he knows at this point that if he's going to publish, really publish theories that rock the foundations of evolution and the position of the church, he's going to need some really, really strong evidence to do that. The theory is going to challenge the established religious and sometimes scientific paradigms or the, the beliefs of the time, particularly in relation, of course, to human species. And although we've not got time to sort of go into it, actually it's this part of the world. As Fitzroy brings back Jemmy Buttons and the Fugians that he had taken home, so when Fitzroy was down here on the first Beagle tour, he took four natives back from here to London to educate them, as, as was the want of that time, you know. And they brought them back on the second trip of the Beagle. And they were, if you want, reintroduced to their, their own families back here. And that was, um, it's wrong to call it an experiment, but that's what they were doing back then. And that's a whole other story. But he's seen that, and he's seen what that, that kind of like noble savage, a term that Charles Dickens uses to describe people that were not part of this developed Victorian Wardian societies. Anyway, that's for another time. But in his notebooks, he's already starting to have these thoughts of species divergence. And in fact, in his, his second notebook, it's called his B notebook, he's already using the words, um, I think, the, you know, uh, uh, and he has this wonderful little spider diagram, and I think is written at the top of that. I think that this sort of transmutation of species is something that is really key 
to the development of species. He notes this, and uh, it's the sort of formation, the embryo of these ideas that he's going to later become so famous for. But as I say, he doesn't count himself as a biologist at this point. He hasn't got a reputation. And so what he actually does is he starts working on biology. He retrains himself. In fact, um, once he's got uh, his teeth into it, he starts studying barnacles, of all things. He spends the next 22 years studying barnacles in the fossil record and the living record and seeing how they changed incrementally over time. And in fact, his work, he got the Royal Medal uh, from the Royal Society in London for his work on barnacles. And it was only at the end of that that he starts to really think, I've actually now got my reputation high enough after 22 years of study to really publish something significant in biology. His wife's helping him write a lot of this up. But he knows it's going to be controversial. Charles Lyell, his great mentor, is pushing him. You've got to publish this. It might be controversial. You've got to get it out there, mate. You know, come on. Publish. Publish or be damned. That's what we're all told in academia. And uh, that's really how it goes. You're not going to get the next grant check unless you publish your first one. Um, so publish, publish, publish. Um, but it's something else cap capitalizes that publishing. And it's this chap, Alfred Wallace. And if you don't know anything about Alfred Wallace, go and read about him as well. Marvellous, marvellous chap thinking about and observing science. Alfred Wallace, um, okay, he's Welsh, so maybe I do have a particularly fond spot in my heart for Alfred Wallace. Came from South Wales. Um, but he, he was inspired. He'd already read some of what Darwin was speculating on. And he doesn't come from the sort of society that you know can go on these grand tours or anything else. He's a pretty poor, hard-working chap. Um, he's corresponding with Darwin. He sets off to the Amazon and the Malay um, archipelago to work on things. And he's corresponding all the time with Darwin, saying, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that idea? And, and you know, Darwin's not nicking it. He's just, he's, you know, Darwin's got fantastic independent thought of his own. Um, but he is uh, realising and starting to realise that, that, that this chap has got something great to say. And there's one letter in 1858 that Wallace writes to Darwin. And in it, he uses the terms on the tendency of variance to depart indefinitely from the original type. And that is so close to what Darwin is speculating on. Darwin realizes, and particularly Hooker and, uh, and Lyle realize, that these two have effectively the same thoughts coming out. That unless Darwin does something pretty quick, Wallace is going to publish part of what he, he, he is thinking. Although Wallace gives it to Darwin and says, you know, I have not got the reputation to publish this. You now have the reputation. And so on a very, very famous 1st of, um, 1st of July, 1858, both um, academics, if you want to call them that, both researchers, both scientists, both... Uh, evolutionary biologists, we would call them now, have their papers read at the, uh, one of the big um, scientific societies' meetings in London. They're read effectively simultaneously. Both are presented at this one meeting. Darwin's, of course, is the one we know now. Uh, Wallace, many people have never heard of, um, but his came up at the same time. And both of them really should be credited with this thought of, if you, if you want, the origin of species. Um, neither of them, in fact, actually was present when, when these, these papers were read. Darwin, one of his kids was sick, and he was at home with the kid, and, and Wallace was off uh, still surveying in the back of beyonds. However, they were both uh, read at this one particular meeting. I mean, shortly after that, Darwin began the, to write up, finally, The Origin of Species, an abridged version uh, he was working on. It was published in 1859, and, of course, it was a total sensation at the time. Um, it came out there. I mean, it's had a fundamental, of course, impact uh, from then to today. You know, the impact on science, the way humans viewed the world and their place within it. Um, our view on science, our view on species has never been the same since then. Thank you for listening to me this afternoon. I hope that's uh, rounded our trip off nicely for you. I guess we have a few minutes for questions if there are, are any here, but uh, 
don't ask me about DNA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so this is, a, this is a question on about establishing, you know, plate tectonics as a unifying theory. A number of people um, had speculated, Darwin effectively had, um, you know, a number of other people had speculated on this. And what we didn't have was a kind of a unifying mechanism. And ironically, it was World War II that really gave us that. And so in World War II, what was happening was, you know, in protection of um, submarines going across the Atlantic and trying to protect the North Atlantic fleet, the British and the Americans in particular were using what's called magnetometers, so magnetic instruments, to record the seafloor. And they were trying to do that so that submarines, could, when they were underwater, could locate where they were based on magnetic signatures of the seafloor. And what we found was that um, either side of the spreading ridges, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the magnetics of the seafloor is striped. And, it, and it's striped in a way that, you know, here's the, 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 the mid-Atlantic ridge comes out and it spews new rock and either side the ocean floor goes like this. And so it's magma comes up and as it comes out onto the sea floor and it cools, the magnetic signatures of the earth are locked in that rock. Now, what happens to the magnetic signatures of, of the, the earth is that periodically... They, they flip, so the North Pole becomes the South Pole and the South Pole becomes the North Pole. Okay? And uh, when that happens, the magnetic signatures of the rocks, as they are set in, flips. So you see what we call magnetic stripes on the seafloor. And so um, if, if rock comes out today, uh, you know, North Pole's here, South Pole's there. I'm going to guess in another 200,000 years, okay, when the rocks are coming out, the poles are going to have flipped because they do this periodically. And the, the North Pole is going to be down there and the South Pole is going to be up there. And that's set in the rock. On either side of the ridges, as they come out, there are magnetic stripes on the seafloor. And that gave us the first evidence that, that uh, plates were being created on these boundaries. And then we started to understand the other subduction boundaries and strike-slip boundaries. So magnetic pole reversal, magnetic mapping, and, and that was really what we first then, you know, got the aha. Now we understand how plates are formed, how the engine of, of molten rock is working inside the earth. Yeah. So the great war effort. <laughs> was there a, a... No? Okay. No? Yes? No? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, so this is a question about, about Lamarck's theory about, you know, um, so, so a simple way, uh, no, a way of thinking about um, species development is, so you can think of it in two ways. So if you don't have a, have a quality, okay, so, or you have an enhanced quality, and you don't have the traits of something that... Um, uh, is negative, uh, then, you know, you're going to survive better. So the term survival of the fittest, in other words, is, is, is perhaps misused, and it's not the best way of thinking about how species develops. It's not so much um, if you don't have that trait, you won't survive, it's more, which was Lamarck's thing. It's like you have this or you don't have this, so you survive or you don't survive. Well, survival of the fittest isn't actually how it works. It's inherited behavior of, of through, through the generations of things that are, are favorable rather than having it or not having it. And, and that's really where it differs, if that explains it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd better get off, but um, I will take more questions if there are any. Thank you very much for listening and coming to my talks. <laughs>